Okay, everybody, Mr. Holmes here, and um, I'm going to try to guide you through the first chunk of these two chunks of uh, Chapter 7 in your book. Um, and we're going to be talking about what it means to be social, and then I'll dive in a little bit specifically on termites, and that's going to cover the first assignment uh, for this chapter. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that your book still lists them as um, in the order Isoptera or Isoterra, doesn't matter how you pronounce it. Uh, anyway, and that was a common thing for a lot of entomology books. And then in about 2018, termites were actually yanked out of their own order and they were lumped in with um, the cockroaches. So that's why we've got Blatodia. Uh, in there now. And so anyway, you'll see lots of references to Isoptera or Isoterra, but uh, termites are now considered social cockroaches. And uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. So anyway, if you could uh, either uh, jot down some quick notes or something like that just to, you know, keep things organized, this will probably help you through much of the um, uh, assignment that I've got that goes along with this. So, all right, let's move on. So, um, while we are working through this chapter, I'd like you to think of similarities between humans and termites, or humans and bees, or humans and wasps, or humans and ants, uh, but then also think about how we are different. And, um, you know, there's a lot uh, you'll find a lot of similarities and a lot of differences as we go uh, through the chapter here. So, all right. Uh, moving on, in terms of what it means to be social, there are actually three requirements for being considered uh, social. Uh, one of the uh, terms we're going to be talking about is eusocial insects, and this means these are uh, truly social insects. Uh, you might remember from biology class, um, uh, eukaryotic organisms are organisms that have cells that have a true nucleus. So anyway, that word eu, e -U, um, uh, means true. And so let's cover the three requirements for being social. Uh, first of all, within a colony of uh, social organisms, you have overlapping generations. Uh, within that colony. So they're not all just the same age group. Um, you will have young and old, and uh, this is similar to humans. We've got old people in our society. We've got little teeny babies. Uh, we've got teenagers. We've got middle-aged adults, um, you know, senior citizens of all uh, groups there. So uh, within humans, yeah overlapping generations. Some of your households you might have multiple generations. Maybe your grandparents are living with you uh, as well. Um, so anyway, that's what's going on there. Overlapping generations. Uh, the second requirement to being social is that there is a division of labor. Uh, and also, while you're jotting this down, not all individuals in that colony uh, reproduce. So. Uh, back to division of labor, you'll uh, probably be familiar with the fact that I do teaching. I don't fly airplanes. I don't do um, brain surgery. I don't do police work, and I'm not an EMT, and I don't bake massive piles of bread. Uh, I'm you know, I don't fix the potholes in the society or, or you know, on our roads. Uh, I stick to teaching. But other people in our society are going to fix the roads or do the medical work or do the police work or legal or fly airplanes or fix cars or make music or make art or whatever. Uh, so there's a division of labor going on there. Um, and also not all individuals reproduce within those colonies. We'll talk a little bit about kings and queens and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, so there's that. And then the third requirement for being social is that you've got to have some kind of nest or containment structure uh, for that uh, social group. Uh, so could be a house, could be an apartment uh, complex, it could be a colony that's living underground or whatever. 
So um, that's what's going on there. All right, moving along. Uh, we've got a little bit of new vocabulary there for you. And trophobionts, uh, troph means energy. And then that word, or the chunk of the word biont comes from symbionts or symbiotic relationships where you have different species living and interacting with each other. So um, one of the things that you may be familiar with is that ants, here's a cute little ant on the left, uh, they farm aphids. Now it's not just that they are being kind to the aphids. Uh, the aphids essentially are functioning like parasites on a plant. And you can see this aphid in the right hand picture. It has its beak stabbed into the plant. It is drinking essentially the plant's blood. Um, you may not be that different either. So if you're a huge fan of maple syrup, essentially that is the blood of maple trees. I'm sorry to be so dramatic about it, but basically humans go up to maple trees. We slash their throats. Those trees bleed into a bucket, and then we collect that and pour it on our pancakes. All right. So um, the aphids are functioning in the same way. Uh, now, if I come here, a little pointer. Okay. Uh, so this little tube in the back end of the uh, aphid is producing a droplet of what's called honeydew. So you have sugar water in, and you have some sugar water and probably some proteins that are coming out the back end of that aphid. And essentially, that acts like mafia money for those aphids. Um, uh, the ants are going to be drinking that stuff up right out of the butt of the aphids. And in exchange, the ants are going to be protecting those aphids. So if a murderous uh, ladybug comes crawling down that stem, uh, those ants are going to go after it and get rid of uh, those ladybugs. Um, now, uh, looking off to the back end of this aphid as well, you'll see these two structures. They're called cornicles. Uh, for those of you who have collected aphids in your collections this year, these are little tubes, little exhaust pipes coming out the back of the abdomen. Um, those do not produce the honeydew, but uh, they produce other liquids uh, that include alimones. And if you remember from last chapter, those alimones are secreted to get rid of predators, and if they're under stress, they'll squirt these liquids out. Um, they probably function as an alarm chemical uh, to tell other aphids, oh my god, a murderous uh, ladybug is coming up the leaf here or whatever. So uh, anyway, so the sugar water comes out of the back end of the middle of these aphids. Uh, side note, if you've ever uh, been in a car that you've parked under a tree and you come back to that car and there's a bunch of yucky clear driplets and droplets all over the windshield and all over the car, um, that is honeydew. So if you were to you know, come out to that car and it's all yucked up on the windshield, if you look straight up, that tree probably has a big aphid infestation uh, going on. Uh, so anyway, and you were just unfortunate to park under it. So, all right, moving along a little bit more. Uh, there are some benefits to living in colonies when you're a social organism. And one of the major benefits actually is that you don't waste energy on reproduction. Um, life and reproduction, I don't care if you're a human or a wasp or a hamster or a redwood tree or a rose, that uh, reproduction is very expensive. Um, even for those fruit-bearing plants, um, you know, I don't care if it's apples or cantaloupes or grapes or whatever, that takes a lot of materials to produce those fruits. And so reproduction is ridiculously expensive. I know some of you have been, you know, your parents and guardians and everybody's all harping on you because you ate the, you know, you ate an entire box of cereal in one sitting or you can't stop eating or the cupboards are bare. Uh, you know, part of that is because you're in an age group in your lives where your body is doing a lot of mitosis, a lot of cell division. This is why your grandparents at every single family gathering are, you know, they can't stop 
mentioning, how, oh my gosh, you're so much taller than you were when you were four years old. Yeah, it's called mitosis. Um, so anyway, all in a nutshell, reproduction is ridiculously expensive. Um, whether you're a, a young human that's, um, you know, growing really quickly, uh, you know, into your early 20s, or if you are uh, some plant that's making ridiculously showy flowers or producing um, a lot of fruit or whatever, yeah, it's expensive. So if you live in a colony, not every individual has to reproduce. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, division of labor uh, is a huge benefit. So for me as a teacher, again, I'll, I won't go on and on about this, but hey, I'm doing the teaching. I am not repairing the cars or fixing the roads or doing the brain surgeries or anything else. Uh, that's for somebody else to figure out. Um, not, not that I'm you know, uh, a selfish person or whatever. It's just I fit into the teacher role within humans, um, and I don't fit very well in other roles, uh, but other people will do that. So, um, yeah. Okay, third one here real quick, uh, just um, briefly here. There is safety in numbers. So if you are in a colony of bees and you've got a thousand bees in your nest, um, if a predator comes by, um, let's say even, you know, a, a bear comes by and starts scarfing down on your bee nest going after that honey, um, you're going to, uh, your individual chance of getting killed and eaten might be a, a little bit lower or a lot lower compared to you being a solitary insect. Let's say a, um, a grasshopper walking down the street. If you're that one grasshopper and a bird finds you, guess what? Your chance of getting killed is uh, like 100%. Okay, But if you're in a colony of ants or termites or wasps or whatever, or humans, you know, Godzilla comes down, uh, starts scarfing down on your city, um, guess what? You may not have a 100% chance of getting killed. So there is safety in numbers in living in a colony there. Okay, moving on. All right, here's another word that the uh, the book is going to throw at you. Uh, they'll uh, be talking about inquilines. Um, essentially, those are guests in a colony. Now, they could be beneficial, they could be harmful, or they, like, who cares, they have no impact on that colony. So I'll talk, to, uh, talk about a couple of them here. Uh, rove beetles. So down here in this... Um, you know, little pile of termites, there is a small rove beetle. And um, this beetle has no impact on the termite colony. And so, yay, you know, no big deal. Uh, there are also mites. So this weird looking thing um, off to the right is called a varroa mite. Here are the mouth parts. And if you do a leg count, you've got four on each side. So uh, these are in the mites and ticks uh, group of uh, arthropods, and uh, they are related to spiders and, and all that stuff. The one difference, by the way, just while you're looking at this, notice the entire body segment. It, there's just one single body segment. Mites and ticks have their heads and thorax and abdomens all in one big nugget. Uh, so these are not spiders. Uh, spiders have their uh, head and thorax fused into one piece, and then their abdomen is a second body uh, piece. Anyway, here's a little honeybee with a varroa mite riding on its back. These things are parasites. Uh, however, you could also have some beneficial organisms in the colony. So pseudoscorpions, um, I'll be honest with you, they are, I just, I just love these little guys. Um, if you do a leg count here, we've got eight on each side. So these big old claw looking things are actually modified palps. These are part of the mouth parts, um, obviously for catching prey. They are little tiny, tiny things, about two to three millimeters long, and that's about it. Um, I get all high pitched and oh my god, 
But, you know, whenever I see a pseudo scorpion, um, keep an eye out for these. Uh, you'll often find them in compost bins. And uh, so here's a pseudo scorpion eating a varroa mite. So, yeah, the bees do not mind pseudo scorpions in their colonies because they come around like big old thugs and they catch and kill all the mites. Uh, so, um, anyway, that's a beneficial inquiline. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about termites. And here are a couple of characteristics of, of uh, termites. And the reason why we're going over this is I'm going to talk to you about why they are different from Hymenoptera. Uh, so first of all, termites have uh, equal uh, sex ratios, so uh, same number of females and males within the colony. Uh, the colony is divided into different castes. Um, within humans, uh, there are caste systems in various societies. Uh, and so uh, if you wanted to learn a little bit more, uh, for example, some of the castes um, in India, the uh, untouchables are the people who uh, deal with the dead and, and uh, so that there are other castes that do not uh, wind up, you know, burying and cremation and everything else uh, dealing with the, with the dead. Um, but within termites, there are different caste systems, and we'll go in. We'll go into that in a little bit here. Um, the other thing is that pheromones. Uh, so those are chemicals that are distributed throughout the colony. Uh, we've talked about pheromones before. Uh, they're very um, powerful chemicals in even low concentrations. Um, what these are used for, if the queen. And King realize that their uh, colony is often under attack by predators, either the, if it's ants, um, we'll go into that in a little later on, uh, or if uh, there are aardvarks or anteaters or other, you know, mammals or birds or whatever who's uh, going through their colony eating them. Uh, they may release pheromones that cause the growing young to later develop into more soldiers. Or if the colony is bursting at the seams and they need some more colony uh, or some more containment structure or a larger nest, uh, those kings and queens may re um, produce pheromones that... Uh, require, you know, or that wind up developing into um, more workers instead of soldiers. So, uh, and the way these chemicals are distributed throughout the colony, and it may seem kind of gross, but uh, fortunately termites have low standards or whatever, um, they will transfer these pheromones and they also transfer food uh, throughout the colony, either through vomiting or through eating each other's poop uh, or feces. And so, yep, sounds pretty gross, but it keeps the colony pretty tight uh, and everybody uh, surviving and all that stuff. So, okay, moving along here. Uh, he, these are some of the casts of termites, and I'll show you some pictures on the next slide. And we are wrapping this up, so this will be done pretty soon. Uh, you've got the reproductive uh, individuals. So the kings and the queens, their job is reproduction. They do not fight battles. They do not build the nest. They do not go out and catch food. Uh, their whole job is reproduction. Uh, there are also adultoids. So these, I know it looks like adult-ish or whatever, but these are, you know, anyway, they're kind of similar to the kings and queens. They are there available if the king or queen die, or they could be reproductive, um, supplementary reproductives, uh, which means that they are also doing some reproduction in addition to the kings and queens. Then we go into um, Nisut soldiers and workers. All of these three castes are sterile. They will never have their own kids. Uh, but they are still part of the colony. They are still related to the king and queen. Um, so the Nisuts, I'll show you the, kind of a trippy picture in, a, in the next slide here. Um, so they are sterile. Um, 
they do not have big scary mandibles even though they fight they are part of the defense um, their particular defense is they have a squirt nozzle on the top of their head that squirts out nasty chemicals for anybody who is invading uh, there are other soldiers in the colony that are sterile, of course, and uh, they have big, scary mandibles, and they have giant heads because they have a lot of muscle uh, in their heads to move those mandibles, and those are used for slicing and dicing any invaders, and uh, you'll see a picture of those guys. And then finally, within the uh, termites, you have your workers. They don't go to battle. They don't reproduce. Their whole job is to maintain that nest and, you know, dig more holes and find more food and keep everybody fed. So one thing to keep in mind, within this colony, uh, everybody has their own jobs. doesn't matter if you are part of defense or if you are part of feeding or if you are part of reproduction. Um, Kind of a strange analogy to this is if you think of your own body, you have all these different organs and they all have their own jobs. They all depend on each other. Uh, if your lungs stop working on you or your bones stop working uh, in your body or if your immune system says, forget it, that's it, I'm done. Or if it's your nervous system that goes, that's it, I'm not helping anymore. You know, the only, um, what I'm trying to say here is that all of your organs are intertwined and interdependent and the entire survival of your body requires all of them to be doing their jobs. Similarly, within a termite colony or an ant colony, everybody has their own jobs. And if there's any faction of the colony that doesn't do their job, that could bring down the entire colony. Uh, so, um, you know, kind of interesting stuff here. Okay, let me move on because we're uh, almost done with this thing here. Um, okay, a couple of pictures. You can probably tell in the very top left, uh, we have a queen and all of this giant chunk is abdomen. Uh, you will see some workers and soldiers around her. They are cleaning her they feed her, they defend her. Um, her legs are right here. It is very difficult for her to even move. Uh, and she is just going to produce millions of offspring, you know, as long as she's around. By the way, uh, these can live, you know, up to 20 years or so, even more. Uh, and so um, those queens are a really important part of that colony. If she dies, let's hope there's some supplementary reproductives. Otherwise, the workers and the soldiers have nothing, um, and that colony could die out. Here's a winged uh, adult that's, um, these go ahead and get ready to set up other colonies. To the right, uh, there's a soldier in the top picture here, and you see that big giant head. Most of that is muscle, so you can operate these big old chompers. Um, and their entire job is just defense. They are just part of, they are the, you know, basically the military uh, portion, the defense, the soldiers uh, in the colony. Here's a worker, uh, so not huge jaws or anything. These workers do not go to battle. They are tasked with just finding food and um, uh, anyway, uh, they they can't really help that much with defense, and they will never reproduce on their own, um, unless they are tapped to later become an adultoid. Um, but we can the book will kind of go into that in a little bit. Uh, finally, these little nozzly guys. These are the nasuts. Uh, notice they do not have giant uh, mandibles, but these are part of the cast that is also involved in defense of the colony. And they've got big giant poison squirt nozzle nozzles on the top of their heads. So, okay, moving along. Uh, last little tidbit on here before I uh, wrap this thing up. 
Um, termitaria is a fancy name for termite colonies. And if you look to the picture of the right, there's an adult human standing next to one of these termitaria. So we're talking maybe, I don't know, 15, 17, 18 feet tall. Uh, each of these termitaria would have millions of individuals in them. Uh, you could have multiple queens, multiple kings. You could have millions of soldiers, millions of workers. And um, one of the, so the way they are built is it's a mixture of soil and poop and saliva all chewed together into this big structure. Um, essentially, it's a castle that they have built. And one of the really cool things on these guys is that the termites, um, well, okay, let me step back to your biology classes. You guys probably remember uh, cellular respiration. This happens in the mitochondria of living cells in plants and animals and fungi. Um, and so uh, what's going on uh, with this is that if you have millions of termites living in these termite colonies. By the way, there's a chunk of the colony living underground. But if you've got millions of termites, um, those are producing a lot of heat and a lot of carbon dioxide as waste products of just being alive. So if you're contained in this castle and you got all these uh, termites that are just cranking out CO2 and cranking out um, heat, uh, one thing that the termites do uh, to keep that flowing out is they build lots of little chimneys within these termitaria. And they drill little holes and they, they have all these tubes and ductwork and pipes and everything else. The heat from their bodies, obviously heat rises. And so the heat is coming out of these termitaria and it's drawing carbon dioxide with them. So it is getting rid of the carbon dioxide that builds up. Um, Obviously, if carbon dioxide built up, let's say you put a big bag over one, a plastic bag or something, and capped this, there would be no airflow. Carbon dioxide would build up very quickly. Heat would build up very quickly. And ultimately, that would uh, snuff out the whole colony. And so they've got uh, pipes and air passageways drawing in fresh oxygen down at the bottom. And then there's all this heat and uh, that is used to get rid of the carbon dioxide uh, in that colony. This is no different from your lungs that are trying to, obviously everybody gets all excited about lungs, like, yay, we're getting all our oxygen. But um, equally important is getting rid of that carbon dioxide. Uh, if your lungs were screwing up on you and were not working to get rid of the carbon dioxide, your blood would become more acidic and then your proteins would is eventually shut down and stop working and then you're done. So um, anyway, kind of a neat structural thing. So, all right, very last slide. I'm going to leave you with just a couple of thoughts here. Um, sorry, we can't, uh, you know, as a class really kind of discuss this too much um, at this at this time and unless we do our Zoom meetings and all that stuff. Um, but I'd like to you to consider, you know, are humans truly social? Why could we be considered truly social or maybe why not? Do we meet all of those three criteria in one of the earlier slides? And then the other question I've got for you, for the non-reproductives, so this is the soldiers, this is the workers, um, when you are on campus and you're collecting insects and you collect a honeybee, those honeybees are never going to reproduce. Um, is there still a benefit to them living within that colony, even though they're not going to have kids of their own? So kick around and explain uh, why, um, why or why not you think that way here. So, uh, okay, let me see if I can wrap this video up here for you and uh, we can get on to.